Okie dokie. Th- th- this is the bit we've kind of not, not done before. It, it, might, it might work, it might not, but I, I'm always kind of interested. Um, I said to Martin before we started that um, <coughs> on every concert that I've seen Martin play, and they've all been great, of course, uh, but there's always tidbits of information about the songs and where they came from. And uh, yeah, I'm the sort of person that's, oh, tell me a bit more about that, but there's never time. So we thought we'd just set aside you know, like 15 minutes of time to, 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 to ask a few questions about Mar- Martin's background, the songs and that sort of stuff, and, and just see what comes out of it. Does that sound all right? Oh, okay. Can I ask the first question? My fa- favourite song, you sang your second favourite song, my favourite song's always been the famous flower of serving men, and I've never fully understand, s- understood its context in history, whether there is a context in, in history uh, or not, or whether it's just all kind of been made up. So could you, t- with that, the explanation ought not to be as long as the song, of course, but if you could tell us a bit about it, Martin, I'd appreciate that. Um, <coughs> well, I can only tell you about, t- tell you about the song. Um, um, I'd, I'd it's, it's in the, the child ballads, English and, English and Scottish popular ballads, Francis James Child. <coughs> and I'd sung, uh, been singing for a year, a couple of years, a song called Prince Heathen, which happens to be number 104. And I was sort of noodling around because they, uh, they're l- loosely, loosely categorised. And I was sort of hunting around there for for something else that that, that might bite as deeply as does um, Prince Heathen. And uh, number one oh six, <coughs> right at the yeah, at the, it's got quite a long note before you actually get to the song. And right at the beginning of the notes, there were f- uh, five verses printed which were the most electrifying thing I'd ever seen in a song in my life. Um, I was absolutely thunderstruck. And I thought, oh, God, I've got to do this, got to do it. Uh, turned over the, the, the uh, at least one page, maybe two pages, don't remember. And there was the song itself, the full song, and I read it through, and it was w- w- hopeless. It was wooden, to say the least. This, th- th- These five verses were just... Well, as I say, we're electrifying. We just so I thought we're going to have to have a go at, 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 uh, at doing something about this and try and find another. I decided to try and find another another song in the. Um, I better explain the song. It's st- I, 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 the, the first five verse, verses are. Um, my mother did me deadly spite, for she sent thieves in the dark of the night. Put my servants all to flight. They robbed my bow. They sh- they robbed my bow. They slew my knight. They couldn't do to me no harm, so they slew my baby in my arm. Left me naught to wrap him in, but the bloody sheet that he lay in. They left me naught to dig his grave, but the bloody sword that slew my babe. All alone the grave I made, and all alone the tear I shed. And all alone the psalm I sang, and all alone the bell I rang. I leaned my head all against the block, and there I cut my lovely locks. I cut my locks, and I changed my name from Fair Eleanor to Sweet William. Sorry, it's four and a half verses. Um, that was it. And as an opening for a, for, for, for a song, that's, that's pretty bloody electrifying, I think. And the, the, the rest of the song, two or three pages later, just... Didn't seem to get fr- didn't seem to be from fr- from the same the same thought the same thought processes, so I decided anyway I, w- I went through what what's going to happen it's one of those one of those things where she it, it the, s- the famous flower of serving men a famous the famous flower is is the is the Mayflower and the Mayflower is the flower of bad luck and mischief, um, and uh, what you've got is is a uh, a girl who's dressed up as a man to be to to, to and, and is, is has gone into ser- into the service of of, of, a, of a local king. Um, uh, well, she'd basically run away and gone to a, if you like another country, another state, somewhere else, where nobody knows anything about her. She's dressed up as a man. She's taken service with the local king, and uh, she's hiding. Um, so what has to happen is that s- s- somebody has to find out what's uh, what's going on, and she has to be, uh, and she has to be she has to be somehow rescued, and um, she, her disguise is very good, and the the king she's wonderful at her job, and the the, the king makes her very quickly his his personal servant, his his chamberlain, and when the king goes uh, goes away hunting, he leaves her in charge, him 
him, her in charge. Um, that bit is clear. Then th there's, there has to be resolution somewhere. And I went through the whole 306 ballads to try and find something that would, uh, that would do the trick and found one which I thought might work, but its problem was, I mean, if you think Famous Flower is long, this one is long. And it's, uh, it's I remember what it's blooming called in a minute. Um, uh, the King, um, sorry, I'll, it's, it's, it's a similar thing, somebody is betrayed, in this case it's a he, and he is, uh, he is sworn to silence. He can, tell no, he can tell no living human being about it. Uh, the, he's, he is rescued by a woman and she realises what's going on he cannot talk to, her, talk to a human being so what she does is uh, get him to because he works in the stables what the, what the hell is this bloody thing called he works in the stables I mean he's a prince he works in the, he's working in the stables and uh, she manages to get him to understand that if, if uh, he he tells one of the horses what's going on. She can be lurking close by and listening, and that's what that's what happens. Um, and I thought, oh, wait, th maybe this is the one. And I started working on it. And as I started working on it, um, I, I started writing verses down and, and, and sticking them somewhere else. So ultimately, I was I was working on like on two fronts, working on on this particular ballad, which I cannot remember the sodding name of. The f <laughs> The Lord of Lawn and the False Steward, that's what it's called. <laughs> the Lord of Lawn, L-O-R-N, thank you, and the False Steward. So, I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic song, but it is, it's big. This, you, you know, you're talking a, a hell of a lot of verses, and you can trim it, but even trimmed, it's huge. Um, and it's a wonderful story. Wish I had the balls to do it. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. I found myself working on on, 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 on two ideas. Uh, that one was, th I was floundering. The other, one, I, the other one, I was just writing verses down and tossing them to one side and, and, and concentrating on the one I was floundering on. And it, this went on for, oh shit, how long? <sighs> Three, four, five months, I suppose, just writing little bits of paper. And I was living in this, in this room in Wilsdon Green and uh, my landlady says, I don't clean rooms. So I said, fine, that's great. And I was, uh, so my floor was covered in little bits of paper. <laughs> and at one point, I was, uh, I was just getting desperate with, with the, the, uh, the Lord of Lawn because it was, it, was, it, was, I mean, it was hard to marry the two ideas. I don't know why it should have been so hard, but it was. And I thought, oh, well, I better do a bit of tidying up. And I started tidying up, and I had all these bits of paper, and I put them on the bed, and I just put a, you know, put that one before them. Wait a minute! And so suddenly, put all the, all the bits together, and found I needed half a verse, and I had a song. And that's what that's. I mean, it was really. That's how it happened, um, and I decided to use that that to to, to play that melody. Um, that beautiful melody, because um, Dave Swarbrick and I had met Hedy West. Do people remember Hedy West? Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful American singer. She was from Georgia, played uh, sort of Appalachian banjo. She had two strings to her bow, actually. She, she played, uh, she was very, very serious about um, Appalachian traditional music. And um, she was also a, a classical flautist and was equally serious about that. So she would get her the, the flautist's hat on and you couldn't talk to her about traditional music. Likewise, when she was in, in traditional, tr traditional music mode, mm. you didn't bring up the subject of the flute, which was all right, it's fine. Lovely woman, apparently very, very serious, but when you got to know her, she had a, she had a fabulously zany sense of humour. Wonderful woman. And she died in the, I think she died in the 90s. She wasn't that old when she died. Did she write that m that melody? Or no, she didn't. What oh. she did, she f the, the, the melody comes from a, a, a collection of Utah. It's a small collection of songs from Utah, and I cannot remember mm. what what what, uh, what the collection is called. I actually f found it looking, and I'm not going to be able to remember it all of a sudden. Um, I actually saw the collection once, and the uh, the tune is. 
how she saw what could what, what could happen with this tune. I mean, she must have been just she must have been fired by it. It's a very simple tune, and it's as I remember, it's in three four. It's in, in three four time. One three time time. And when D D uh, Swarb, D when Dave Swarbrick and I met her by chance, Swarb and I had been sent by the British Council to Macedonia in, uh, in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, um, to Skopje, where they'd had an earthquake in 63 or 64, was uh, it? Can somebody remember? Was it 64? It was 64, yeah. 63 or 64. Um, and it was a very nasty earthquake. And what the, um, what the town did uh, after that was to, was to have a festival to celebrate um, um, to celebrate, well, just to celebrate Skopje and the rebuilding of it, and invited representatives from every country that had sent aid. So Swar D Dave Swarbrick and I were sent over for as, as the as, as the English British, I beg your pardon, the the, the 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 British Isles contingent, and we were standing in this hall feeling very lonely because there was this amazing music going on. And spotted uh, in, in the gloom, because the, the, the auditorium was dark, s spotted this figure that, I know that figure. I said, Isn't that, that's Hedy. He said, no, it can't be. I said, that's bloody Hedy. So I went across and I said, Hedy. And she looked across and, oh, my God, what are you doing here? And she'd come in from, uh, she, she used to go to Eastern European, uh, East, Eastern Europe a lot, um, very much in defiance of, uh, of, of State Department policy, but she would just do it. She had friends in East Germany. She had a lot of friends in Bulgaria, and she'd just come through from Sofia on, uh, <laughs> on spec. Um, the Americans do that. They, distance is no object for them. We're the, ones who were, uh, we're, we're the ones who were impressed by distance. Mm. I certainly am. Thank, thanks for that detailed reply. Is anybody yes, in the audience here that like, you know, like to ask anything about anything, really? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, a double barrel question, please. I was once in an, o in, in an audience with you, Martin, at Preston University, when we listened to an illustrated talk by Will Cowfell. Oh, yeah. About Woody Guthrie. Yes. Um, so the first question is, if you don't mind me asking it, why were you there? And secondly, how much have you actually been into um, American folk music, and do you actually play it now? Um, no, I don't play it now. Well, I, pl I play a little bit of a little bit of it at home, um, not very well. I'm 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 a five string banjo enthusiast rather than a player. Um, um, I do love it. It's wonderful music, and I, I must say, as I get older, I, I find it increasingly difficult to to compartmentalise it. Say so that is definitely American. This is definitely English, because. Um, there's so there's so much com common ground. What the English English language music spread far and wide, and it's it, it, wherever it goes, it acquires it acquires different characteristics. But I find it really hard. I find myself saying, I, I I've sung, uh, I do sing, a version of a song called Young Edwin in the Lowlands, which some of you will know, I'm sure. And I learned this version, the the version I sing from um, a book of Ozark Mountain folk songs, which is, uh, we're talking about uh, Arkansas and uh, Arkansas and Missouri. But this was particular, particular one was from Arkansas. And I, 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 I would always spontaneously introduce it as, this is an English song from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Because interesting things, interesting things had happened to it, but nonetheless, it felt to me like an English song. It seems to me that, that b between England and America, there's this, uh, th there's this sort of like an, an Atlantic tradition. There's so much, so much crossover between the, the uh, loosely speaking, the English, the, the Eastern Seaboard of the United States, and that goes quite a bit inland as well, and uh, and Britain. Mm. Um, and I find it, I'm having increasing trouble. I mean, th the thing about uh, uh, Appalachian banjo. Is that um, I mean that that particular knockdown style, you know, the, the the one you play with the backs of your nails, the double thumbing and stuff. Where that comes from is West Africa. I mean that's the that's the interesting connection there. P 
people talk about the blues coming from, from Africa. Yeah. All right. Maybe. But the stuff that does come from Africa is the banjo. A friend of mine to 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 tells a story, a man, man called Jody Stecker, tells a story about a, a friend of his who's far too nervous to play on stage now, and these days only makes, makes guitar and banjo strings. But he went, uh, he, he went to, uh, to, to Marrakesh, and he sat down in Marrakesh and started playing the banjo. And people were crowding around and, li and, li and, and listening. And a mate of his who spoke, spoke the language sort of leaned in and said, you do know what they're saying, don't you? And he said, no. Do they? I like, what, what, no, what are they saying? He said, saying he's playing in the old-fashioned way. Mm. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, yeah. that, ah, that is fabulous. Yeah. But, it, but that to me, that's a fabulous hybrid, what's happened there. But it's this b between this British Isles, a lot of Scots, a lot of Irish, well, especially Scots and English. But the Irish come in as well. The Irish get everywhere. Um, mixed, with, with, mixed with West Africa, and look what happened. Look what happens and continues to happen. It's wonderful. And now that uh, now the African Americans have started reclaiming the banjo again, life starts to get interesting because they they, ba they are, uh, African Americans abandoned the banjo because of the minstrel shows. Mm. No. Largely, I'm sure there's other reasons as well. But now they're reclaiming it. Kev, I think Kev, did you have a question to ask? Didn't you? Uh, it's about repertoire, really. I, I was wondering, um, when you're seeking out new songs or finding That's a that's a better question than you imagine, actually. Ask me the question again when I've s s said this. S s said this, because I I find myself loosely speaking working in two separate ways. If I've, lear if I've learned from from a singer, I've learned from a recording. Then I think that one of the things you you really ought to do. It's a bit high-handed to say that, but I think it's I, th I think it's important. I think and I think it's very exciting too. Is you try and pass on not just the song, but some of the reason why you learned that song from that person. Something that person did actually, you know, threw a switch in you. So if it throws a switch in me, why don't it throw a switch in you? Mm. So I, I, I've. I think it's really important to try and retain some of that, and the song will then develop, may well develop away, uh, away a lot of the time from that. I would hope that it retains that, that 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 spark as it develops, because it will change willy nilly. It will change. Um, when you're working from from a from a book, anything goes, especially if the book is a book without tunes as the child collection always was. Anything goes. But then it's incumbent on you to actually recognise what it is in that song that, that, that is so very, very special to you. Because a lot of those songs will... will um, pr pr a lot of those, those songs may well um, highlight a different part of the ballad. I love the big ballads. I like those whopping great things. But the different versions may often highlight a different different part of it. And you make your choices. But actually anything goes, I think. Because you're remaking it. It's it's off a it's off a piece of paper. Then then you have to be true to it. And that's subjective. <laughs> Fascinating detail there, Martin. Get that. Well, maybe I'll try to think, to, to give me the question again no. because I'm a feeling there's, there's there's another there's more to say. Okay. No, I was just wondering if, if, if that process has changed over over. The <coughs> yes. Yeah. Well, there's 
th there's compared with, with the late 50s and early 60s, there's a fabulous amount of information out there. I mean, in, in, in the 50s and 60s, repertoire was oh, so hard to get hold of. And that's why <coughs> a lot of us, was, you know, you know I, f I feel it was like a subterfuge, which was to learn how to, to get a song on one hearing, which, you know, at the age of 18, 19, 20, you can do. You can, you can treat, uh, you can teach yourself. I mean, I've, I've got a, f a, a journalist friend who was mentored by this particular journalist, I think this uh, very well-known, Cyril Connolly, who taught him <coughs> how to do a three-hour interview without notes. Sit there and listen to it and remember the entire thing. I mean, that's phenomenal. But he can do it. This guy can do it. Sit there and talk to you, and he can just repeat the you know, He can write down the conversation, and it's pretty much flawless. And it's and when you to, to be interviewed by someone like that who's not taking notes or making sure that his his recording equipment is okay. It's 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 fantastic. Very exciting. I've been, I've been interviewed by this guy once. Time for the question? Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? We, we'll probably make this the last one, I think, because it's... Uh, we'll oh, sorry. Well, last two. Last There's two. We'll two. do last There's two. two. Last two. Last two. Who's going first? I was just going to ask you, uh, you, uh, you tuned up uh, two, two guitars, and why are you using two guitars? Just a technical question. They're just uh, uh, different. They're just in very, very different tunings. Um, the, 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 the smaller guitar... Uh, is, is has heavy gauge strings on it, and the the, uh, the the top string is tuned to A. Um, the other guitar, the, the top string is potentially tuned to E. That's a fifth difference, and you can't get you can't get a string that's going to be able to sound sound properly with that you know with, with, you know with, with that range between them. It just sounds. If, if you dip, if you put put on on a normal E string and then tune it down to A, it just flaps around like, you know, like a like a dead fish. It's, you know, it's, it's no good. So the answer is, yeah, I, I just had to start carrying two guitars. You know, I just yeah. You played in standard tuning to start with. Oh, I played yeah, t when I first started playing. Yeah. Yeah. And I became fascinated by. Well, the, I mean, I, th I, th I think a guitar tune normally is a wonderful instrument. <coughs> and I always descri describe it as, as being like an, or it's an orchestra in your lap. And that's, what, that's wonderful. But there's a, the, the, the kind of, the, the body of song that really intrigues me, that excites me, that does all that stuff to me, doesn't, doesn't respond to being orchestrated, I don't think. It's intriguing to listen to, uh, to, to um, what's it, um, variations on, on a theme by Tol Thomas Tallis, and suddenly, oh look, there's Lovely Joan. Mm -hmm. You're recognizing a tune, and it, it's, it's very cleverly done, but it, ultimately it doesn't do anything for the song, I don't think. So it's a question of, uh, but there were a lot of us doing it in the early 60s and meeting up with a lot of those American musicians who were coming over who were playing old-timey music, play, playing, play, playing music in, in those Appalachian banjo tunings. And we just started trying, trying to do something on the guitar with that. And Peggy Seeger say, oh, so says that she's always amazed that people didn't take up the banjo to play English music. They took up the guitar. They couldn't. She could, she's, she said she's never been able to understand that because the banjo was there in the tunings that we wanted to play in. There it was, but I never, never really wanted to play the banjo. I always wanted to play the guitar, and I ended up with the guitar that's tuned like a cello. Work that one out. I mean, it's coincidental that it happens to be tuned to a cello, but it's an instrument that the cello is an instrument that plays cello and the viola is, is tuned the same way, only an octave up. 
um, a, a, an instrument that, can, that plays melody, that, that thrives on melody. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, should we do the last one? Yeah, apart from Eliza, who's your favourite young folk singer and why? Um, favourite young folk There's a few, actually. There's um, Laura Hockenhull, I think, is lovely. Emily Portman is lovely. Oh, what's that guy? Is, that, oh, is it Stephanie Klodowski? Is that her name? She's fabulous. Quirky as all hell. But, oh. There's a few, you know. And I'm someone who, for whom uh, Norma or, uh, uh, said, uh, has, has said to me in the, uh, in the past, you know, when we, we'd not been married that long, she said, she said to me, the most beautiful sight she can ever see is the sight of a man making music. And it set me to thinking, and it's, I realised that all my favourite singers are women. So for me, the most beautiful sound in the world is the sound of a woman singing. And I'm not going to say that I can't think. I, I, I can't think of a, 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 of, a, of a male singer at the moment. I mean, I'm, I, I walk out that door and I'll suddenly run back and say, come everybody, I've just thought of a man. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, women singers, just I, I find just, they move me. It's a fabulous sound. And it, it, it can be, it can be in any any kind of music. You know, I absolutely adore, except when she when she's crazy, adore Maria Callas. You know, just what she what, what that little frame could do with a voice going sort of three octaves, boom, right down there, to wham, right up in the coloratura, just knock your head off. Bloke can't do that. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for those questions. Uh, or Billie Holiday. I mean, there's, a, there's a, you know, a, vo a voice like that which is not, not anywhere near as, 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 uh, as accomplished, but just has such heart in it. She only, and she had a very small range, Billie Holiday. Tiny range. But by God, what she could do with it, with timing, her timing. That's, good. That's, that's what singing is. Singing is timing. All the really great singers have got glorious timing. Shut up, Martin. E no, <laughs> that's <is> really <laughs> interesting. Uh, I'll just say the final thing, if I may, and then we move on. Um, I, I happened to be driving my car around Wentworth that morning when you were on uh, Desert Island Discs, <laughs> and I nearly bloody crashed my car into a field when I, I heard about Dylan, a samurai sword, and a bloody <laughs> piano. <laughs> It, would you just just run run that past us again in case it was I didn't hear it properly, and then we'll get on with some more music. <laughs> when um, he was he was he, he was he was getting quite well known in the states on the folk scene was Bob Dylan, and um, this uh, BBC director Philip Savile saw him do, doing a concert at, uh, I think, at Town Hall. It was his concert at Town Hall, the thing that uh, sort of lifted him up several levels. Um, saw that concert and uh, decided that he, he, he was doing a play called Mad House on Castle Street. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but it was, he was a, a white Jamaican. And he had come to, come to Britain and he, was it Evan something or other? Um, he had, he, had, he had come to Britain and he found, found Britain completely bewildering and, and appalling. He thought the place, and, and he wrote this play, because he, uh, and, and Madhouse on Castle Street is basically that England's a madhouse, Britain is a madhouse, and it's all full of castles. That's why it's Madhouse on Castle Street. And all these characters in it were all bonkers. And he wanted, uh, wanted Bob Dylan to be there singing some songs that were part of, part of the action. Um, and uh, Albert Grossman, who was uh, uh, Bob, Bob's manager, sort of jumped at the chance. This is the chance to get to England and maybe open some doors there because he was a very skilled man, very, very skillful manager, very naughty, very funny. <laughs> um, but he, 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 um, he would, every time he brought his, his, his charges over to Britain, he would, he would bring them 
he would start in London and he would take them around the folk clubs because Albert Grossman, his manager, had run a folk club in, uh, in Chicago and was a singer. His favourite song was, uh, was Go To See No More, if anybody knows that song. And he would sing it. He's apparently famous for singing Go To See No More. Um, and he, he brought Bob, and he, he brought him to the, uh, to the King and Queen, where uh, the, the group I was in, we called them groups in those days, Thameside Four had a club. And uh, I said to him, why don't you come to the Troubadour? They said, that was a Friday night. Come to the Troubadour tomorrow night. And he came to the Troubadour the following night. And uh, after it was a late night club, started at half past ten, went through to about one, one thirty. And uh, <laughs> as I said, when he was done, because he was staying in, in the Cumberland Hotel or something like that, courtesy of the BBC. Do you want to come back for a cup of tea? Sure, yeah, I'll come for a cup of tea. And walked in, and my then wife, Dorothy, as we walked through the door, said, uh, I'll put the kettle on, make a fire, Mart. And we lived in this great big room, and the landlord had kindly left a stove. He was going to put a gas fire in, a, a gas fire in and we said, oh, no, 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 leave the stove. We, we'll, we'll, it's much nicer, much warmer. Oh, OK. This Irish landlord, lovely boat, Mr. Mead. And uh, I said, OK. And I had this piano. My, my oldest friend had, a, had got this piano. I don't, it's, it's, you've got to understand the geography. He, he got it in Chalk Farm and he pushed it all the way up Haverstock Hill to Belsize Park tube station next door to which I lived. And I saw him there <laughs> outside the door and he said, I said, hello, Bill, how are you doing? He said, how do you think I'm doing? I said, oh, what are you doing? Wait, wait, I've got this piano. I'm going to try and do it up. And it was, a, I mean, I remember we, and he said, C can I leave it with you? A big mistake. So we, we heaved it up the stairs. You know, this, this piano really, really enjoyed being pulled up these stairs. And we manhandled it into, into my room, put it there. And he just went away and forgot all about it. And there was this piano that couldn't be played was completely unplayable. Half the strings were missing, the, the keys were buggered, and you know, it was a cold winter. That winter of 62, 63 was really, really cold. Anybody remember? Yeah. It was. God, it was cold. And you got the panelling like that, and he said, "God, Mark, we haven't got any. We haven't got any coal. We, we couldn't afford coal. He won't mind if you use the panelling. No, he won't mind." So I took the panic, broke it up, and put it on the fire. Oh, boy, it was wonderful. He sat around there. <sighs> wonderful. By the time Bob came into the flat, the, uh, the, the, uh, all, all the panelling had gone, the keys had all been <laughs> burned, and all that was left was the frame. And m I had a pretend Auntie Emily who, had, uh, who, who was, uh, actually worked for security services. On her passport, it said, Actress. But um, like a lot of them, like a lot of people with passports which said actor or actress, uh, they actually worked for the Secret Service. Um, I found that out you know, about 15 years later. Well, a bit less than that, actually, more like 10 years later. Anyway, that, but that's another story, but fascinating. Maybe I'll tell you that, too, unless you want to hear the whole story now. Um, no, she worked for se security services, and I remember her exploding at... Uh, at a news bulletin during about 70, 71, during the, uh, the, the, during the, the, the real troubles in, uh, in, uh, in Northern Ireland. How they, uh, there was mention of, a, of, a, uh, of, 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 of an MI, like it was MI5 and MI6. And there was this other one, and I cannot remember the number, but it was, for the sake of argument, MI12, for the sake of argument. And we sit sitting there. Little, well, I happened to be sitting with her watching the news, and uh, the, the she said the relevant minister stood up in Parliament and said there is no such thing as MI12, and she exploded out of her chair and said, "You bloody liar! There is MI12, and they specialise in breaking people." <laughs> How do you know that, Auntie Emily? Well, no, that's when that's when I was understood what she had done during the war. Because she never was working in theatre, ever. Um, I digress. What what happened was she was given a samurai sword, which um, which f by this uh, American guy, and he he had taken it off a Japanese officer in surrender, and he handed it to Emily, Auntie Emily, who said that she could she she was going to give it to me. It was, she was going to leave it to me in her will. 
This is when I was six and I'd seen this sword. What's that? Oh, do you believe? It's a sword. <laughs> and she showed it to me and said, that's real blood. Oh, really? <laughs> and and eventually, eventually she said, all right, I'll leave it to you in my will. Thank you, Auntie Emily. Uh, and then later she actually gave it to me. She gave it to me for a 21st birthday present. I said, uh, take it away. Take it away. I don't want it anymore. And uh, I was using it to chop up the piano. <laughs> and I walked in the and she said, make a cup of tea. No, I'll, I'll make a cup of tea, Mark. You, do, you make a fire. Okay. And I got, got the sword and I it like that. I was over it like that. Over, over there. And there was this figure in front of me. He probably said, you can't do that. That's a musical instrument. And I said, it's a piece of junk. Get out of the way. And he said, oh, okay. He got out of the way. And I was about to take a swipe at it. And there he was at my shoulder saying, can I have a go? <laughs> <laughs> And so he did. He, he did some, and I did some, and we made a fire. <laughs> it's all true. Next year, will you come back and do the an the Auntie Emily bit to the to the end? We do that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, Ladies that and gentlemen, Martin Carthy. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>